friends, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, hello, hello, and thank you very much for watching me again. Before continuing with my next proper tutorial, I thought it would make sense to first have a talk with you about something that is utterly important yet fairly often sort of overlooked slash underestimated, but still, not only does it in many ways determine our ability to play the instrument, but also, and most importantly, our ability to learn to play it correctly. How many times have we all heard some horror stories about double basses, like a jazz musician goes on tour and for some reason they were unable to fly their bass along with them and had to hire one at the destination. And then they'd be telling us something like, oh my God, that was such a mess, such a horrible bass, the sound was just awful, that bass was nearly unplayable. Sounds familiar. Or maybe sometimes trying to justify quite a poor student's performance, we'd mention something like, yeah, but this wasn't nice bass though, it was actually quite unplayable. Now, it sounds like there was an important keyword there, unplayable. So, we will talk about how to make sure your bass does not fall into this category. We will talk about the double bass setup. I must first of all tell you that the way you'd set up your instrument for classical music is fairly different to that in jazz. And in this video, I'll mostly be explaining the jazz setup, although some of my advice, like those that concern the bridge or the tailpiece, sound post, are perfectly valid for either use. If you're a classical musician, you'd be often looking into getting yourself a nice old instrument, maybe an old German or French or Austrian or even Italian, with the price tag having four zeros and in some cases even nearing five zeros, which is really lots of money. However, if you try to use this otherwise truly lovely bass in jazz, many of them may show surprisingly modest results. There are, of course, specific reasons for that, but one of the main ones is that back in the 1700s, 1800s, there was no jazz and no metal strings, so they just weren't built for that. Although we might talk about all that in more detail in some other video in the future. At any rate, the good news is that the jazz players do not really need to spend crazy amounts of cash for a posh old bass. Those that work the best in our genre are actually quite often simpler modern instruments. At some point I might make another video about the gear that I use myself and that I recommend, so please watch out for it as there I will also give some uh, recommendations on what sort of instruments could work nicely in jazz. However, let's get back to setting up our jazz bass. Obviously, there are some parts that we cannot change or work on, such as the body of the instrument. Yet, we could work on lots of other things. Fingerboard, neck, bridge, sound post, tailpiece, and of course strings. As you may have gathered from my previous tutorial, I'm a big advocate of everything feeling as natural as possible and therefore with the least possible physical challenge as well. As a result of this approach, I myself use very low action strings, uh, roughly three, four, five, six millimeters or even a bit less depending on the specific instrument. Sometimes I get asked how come in my records I sound as if my action was fairly high and what's the trick? So there isn't one, except for the way I set my instruments up. As far as my own sound is concerned, I will put a link to one fairly randomly chosen track of mine into the description of this video just to give you an idea as to what sort of sound I refer to. And of course, you're also very welcome to check out my latest album release, Two Chevrons Apart, that, by the way, has just received a very nice four-star review in the downbeat. Now, some of you might object to a possible volume loss, 
associated with low action. Interestingly, the volume loss is actually way less than one may think if your base is set up properly. On the other hand, as far as my own live work is concerned, I'd say 99.9% .9 of what I do is amplifier gigs. So a slight loss of volume isn't something of concern to me compared to the massive gains, such as, for example, a far better control of the sound and the possibility of playing faster with less effort. Okay, let's start with one of the most crucial elements, the fingerboard. Now, what I'm going to tell you sort of goes against the common belief. The common belief has it that the fingerboard should have a gradual dip towards its middle part, which we also call a slope. The idea behind this is to give enough space for the string to oscillate when played. You see, I'm plucking the string and it oscillates the most towards its middle part to match this dip. Actually, in reality, this dip is often slightly higher than the middle. Why? Because when we bow, the string vibrating length ranges from the top nut to the point where we apply our bow onto the string. Now, it would be important to point out that when we use the bow, especially performing symphonic repertoire, these oscillations are far greater than those of the jazz pits. And this is the primary reason why you cannot play classical music with a jazz low action setup. There just wouldn't be enough space for the bowed string to oscillate. At any rate, the rule of thumb is that the lower you want your action, the less slope your fingerboard should have. Why is this so? Let me pluck an open string for you. I touch it with my right hand somewhere here, but then remove it and the bow would normally stay on the string. Right, so vibrating uh, length spans from the upper nut to the bridge. Thus, the point of the major oscillation would be somewhere towards the middle part, as I told before, which would roughly match the fingerboard sloping profile. Now, as soon as I move my left hand somewhere down the road, let's say here, the vibrating length of the string will shorten to the distance between my finger and the bridge. Therefore, the area of max oscillations of the string will also drift downwards and that's where it won't be matching the fingerboard sloping profile anymore, as in this point the fingerboard will already be going back up. Now, if I move my finger even further down, it will only worsen the things because the uh, max oscillation point will drift again and here the fingerboard will keep raising, so it won't be matching the sloping profile of it at all and as a result it will make um, playing in thumb positions extremely buzzy, if not impossible. This is the primary reason why, if you want to use low action, your fingerboard should be just straight vertically, at least under G, D and A, as these are the strings we tend to use in higher positions. Well, summing it up, the lower your strings are, the straighter your board must be, the less slope it should have. The E string is slightly different though. It is very thick and we do not normally use it up there, rather staying just in lower or medium positions. This is why we actually do need a slope under E and quite a significant one, somewhere here. However, one small but important observation needs to be made. The fingerboard should still have a tiny drop just after the top nut just to give enough space for the string to vibrate, but then it must stay straight just after that. As far as the material is concerned, it is best to have an ebony fingerboard, and if you have a choice as to which to install, always try and go for the best possible quality. By the way, 
You can actually reshape the fingerboard yourself at home just using some simple means as tool knife blades, sandpaper, cotton wool pads and linseed oil. There is no rocket science in it but this process may require lots of time and patience and can turn quite frustrating if the ebony of your board isn't particularly amazing. Which is one more reason to try and make sure you do get a nice quality if you can choose. In one of my next videos I might show you how to do all this, how to plane it and which tools to use. The next important bit is the bridge. Likewise, please try and go for the best quality wood to make sure that not only does it sound nice but also does not start to bend upwards or downwards after a little while. Where to position the bridge? In theory, these dents on the F-holes should face the middle of the leg, but in reality, they often are quite on the same level on both sides of the instrument. So my best advice is just to try where it sounds best on your instrument and leave it there. I usually tend to set bridges slightly lower than these marks. Make sure that neither side of the bridge is leaning anywhere, it has to be strictly horizontal. Also, I would highly recommend using the bridge adjusters. Thanks to these, not only can you adapt the string height according to your current playing requirements, but also counteract eventual fluctuations of the top bar caused by weather changes. For example, in cold and dry weather, your strings would go down as the top would sink a little bit. And on the contrary, if it is hot and humid, they might go slightly up. There are several types of adjusters on the market, but for many years I have been keeping my loyalty to the brass ones, as I like their sound the best, both for Arco and Pitts. Maybe it has something to do with the density of the material, but in my experience, aluminium, wooden, ebony or plastic adjusters never felt quite good enough. Make sure the top of your bridge is not too thick and that each string pops out by half of its diameter here. All the luthiers perfectly know about this, so if the bridge on your base does not look this way, just bring it to your base repairer. They will also know how to correctly set up the tailpiece. What's important is that there is enough length of the string between the bridge and the tailpiece so that the overtones are produced. Your repair might, for example, have to shorten a little bit the cord that fixes the tailpiece to the end pin right there. As far as the material is concerned, uh, some while ago there used to be the seemingly appealing Tomastic tailpieces, and they probably still exist, with a nice advantage of built-in tuning machines like the violin would have, or cello maybe. And that was especially interesting if uh, the main tuning machines weren't accurate enough. But the trouble is that they are made of metal, which does not sound that nice. So I myself, I would always try and use the wood be it an ebony or just any other painted wood, as I prefer the way the wood resonates. The next element that may affect both the sound and the playability is the sound post, which is inside there. Now, it has to be installed by a professional, and by moving it slightly in various directions, you may achieve some notable differences in sound and response. I personally tend to keep it a bit lower than its classic position, but no universal advice can be given here as every instrument is different, so as every player. However, make sure it is not too short, as otherwise when you need to fly your bass and lower the string tension when packing it into the flight case to ensure there is less pressure on the neck, an overly short post might fall off if the bass gets accidentally subjected to any g-forces. Sometimes I even put a post-setter into my flight case. 
Again, resetting needs to be done by a professional, but if you have a setter with you and you just need to save the game, you can still manage to stick it in just until your luthier can fix it properly for you. Another important topic where no universal advice can be given due to all our differences and those of our basis is the choice of strings. I myself tend to use Thomastic uh, Spiracore Vi as G and D and Daddario Pizzicato Light Gauge as A and E, but sometimes you may want to try what we call a mix and match set. Strings of different brands and makes uh, put on your base according to its specific qualities. For example, on this my base, on the G string is a Thomastic and the three remaining are the Dario, as I feel such a combination works better on this particular instrument. If you feel your base is pretty tense, you need light gauge strings and vice versa, but this is quite obvious. Generally, the bigger basses tend to be less tense. Now the neck. Make sure it is not too thick for you. If it is, a base repair can do some work on it and make it a bit smaller. Too large a neck may cause physical difficulties and strains. By the way, physical difficulties and strains can also be caused by the overstand. If your base is modern, the chances are that it was made to contemporary standards and nothing needs to be amended. Generally, the overstand should be somewhere between two and a half and four centimeters. If it is less than that, it may lead to the angle of the fingerboard being too flat and as a result to a notable difficulty in reaching out into the thumb positions, also because your arm will be hitting the slope continuously. For example, this, my base, is a late 19th century German with a completely new neck and scroll, and when refitting it, we had to opt for the large 4 cm overstand. This instrument has very high slopes and there was no way to go for less than that. Many older basses have a flat angle of the neck due to a really small overstand. In the old time, the use of the higher thumb positions wasn't nearly as common as now and some instruments even had super short fingerboards as there was no need to play this high but the times have changed. Therefore, if your base has a tiny overstand, you might want to look at resetting the neck, which can be quite a costly operation though, especially if your base is a so-called blockless wonder and the block would need to be fitted in as well. So it'd be wise to evaluate whether this all makes sense from the economical point of view. If it does not, the feasible alternative might unfortunately be starting to look for a different base. Well, I think this is more or less it for now. I hope I have shed some light onto the setup mystery, which actually isn't a mystery at all, as long as you devoted proper attention. If you have any further questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them. Please write to me in the comments or via the contact form on my website, Yuri Golobif. Com. All the very best for now and hope to see you soon again. Please do take a very good care of yourselves and watch out for my next tutorial. Goodbye.